Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's study. And uh, I believe it's study number 71, if I remember correctly. Um, so we've been going through uh, Daniel 11 for quite a while. And now I'm feeling a little bit burnt out on Daniel chapter 11, to be honest, just because this is very taxing uh, mentally, the time that I've spent looking at these things and trying to sort them out. Plus, there's a lot of other stuff happening. So um, uh, we definitely need God's uh, guidance in how we're approaching this study. And um, so as we join as we join together in prayer, I, I want I ask that people can continue to pray for these studies and um, that uh, that we can have something that we can present to people. That's why we're going through this uh, document and and doing something that's going to be helpful for people. So we need to get this document prepared. So it's going to still take us time. But anyway, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful, so thankful, um, that we are able to meet together and to dig deep into your word. We are thankful for the light that you've given us over the past few years, how you have led this movement, led each of us individually. And Lord, we just ask that your spirit can continue to speak to us that we can reveal your character, that we can speak of your love to others, and that we can share truth uh, to those who are in darkness. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust fully in you. And be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So. Um, where we finished off last week was struggling with verse 10 of Daniel chapter 11. And the struggle, if I can sort of uh, kind of frame what, what has happened. I know that I've gone over this quite a few times. So I think we're pretty solid in looking at um, the Greek Empire, Alexander's Empire, the fall of his empire is being paralleled in our time to the fall of the Soviet Union. And that we can see what has happened in our history in connection with 9-11, in connection with Trump and Biden. All of those things that we saw with the Persian kings can be seen here in the Greek kingdom. Now, as we deal with this battle, these various battles between the North and the South, we can see that they uh, they reflect Daniel 11, verse 40. That is what happens with first France uh, conquering um, the king of the north, which in this case is the papacy. And then we see what happens in the response, the United States and the papacy, the king of the north, uh, coming against the king of the south, which at that time is the Soviet Union. And, and the way that this was understood, at least by Chowatu, um, when he started going through these verses, is he was bringing everything back to that parallel, to 1798 and 1989. Now, we have, we have made an application. We're not saying that this is the only application, just as we did in the book of Judges. We are making an application to our time. That is, we're taking this whole thing and placing it as our line from 1989 to the Sunday law. So we're saying that this history typifies what's going to happen. So the, the history in connection with these prophecies are going to be repeated. And we're in the repeat of those histories. So Chowatu's interpretation, probably nothing wrong with it, except that that's not the application that we're making. We're making an application after the events of November 9th, 2019. Something that he could not possibly have seen or applied. So, so some of the 
the criticisms that I'm receiving, as you see in some of the videos, if you go to the, the comments, there's criticisms about, well, Chawatu had this perfect interpretation. You're kind of messing with it. Now, it, the, the criticism also is that somehow we're, we're proud, we're, we're going in the direction of a cult. Um, um, you know, we need to be more humble, all of these types of things. I guess I need to be is the suggestion. But we're approaching this the only way we know how, by comparing scripture with scripture, by using Miller's rules and um, applying the symbols that are given to us for our time. These symbols wouldn't be meaningful in the time that Chawatu was dealing with Daniel chapter 11. They wouldn't have meant anything to him, but they do mean something to us. And so, so that's why we're approaching things this way. And we know that we have predictions that have been made regarding Trump and Biden and what's gonna happen here in the very short term, some kind of Sunday law. And we don't believe that that can be the case because we haven't come to midnight yet. And sure, the last events will be rapid ones, um, but we know that there's a lot that has to happen and that the rapidity that is that would be required uh, would be unrealistic if you're going to have, let's say, a Sunday law in 2024. Because we need a message uh, to go to Seventh-day Adventists, and we don't really even have a message to give them. And the movement is really in tatters. And um, so if we're going to make a parallel, uh, we would have to say that that parallel is... Um, in Adventist history, it would be that that history from, well, I guess, you know, 1850, uh, that sort of that era to to the time of the charts, you know. So so we're in that time. That's early writings, page 74. We've been in that time for a few years, and um, if you look at what's happening there, you have a handful of Adventists who are accepting. You know, October 22nd, 1844. And many of those are going to fall away. So there's going to be very few of those people who had gone through the Millerite history uh, that are still going to be there, uh, especially when you get to something like 1863. And so we see the same thing happening in our movement. We see that we've had our disappointment. Um, we see Jeff paralleling Miller. Uh, we we see um, uh, we, we saw with FFA initially you're going to have this whole group um, just renounce that God was even leading this movement and and finally Jeff is going to basically say yep yeah, the, the movement was in darkness from 2013 to you know till July of this year when um, uh, it's going to be the coming of the comforter, I guess, is how he puts it, right? Um, and we can see that his applications don't really make sense. They're not consistent with what he's taught in the past. And there isn't a consistent way to interpret those lines. And then we've seen within the movement itself, uh, these predictions regarding Trump. And, and um, then mostly what we would see is um, just the division that has happened, the type of um, way in which we're addressing people who differ with us, uh, that this can't be how we deal with one another. Um, it definitely isn't productive. And so we're left here with a handful of people studying Daniel chapter 11. And part of the reason we're doing this is in answer to, um, I guess, the the questionings that I have regarding what what is being said about Trump becoming president again. So, well, and it wasn't done. It, it, you know, it's hard to say what somebody else's motive is. 
but it seems the only reason it was done so that they could they could then criticize what we're presenting. So it doesn't seem like they were really truly interested in studying this together. They just wanted me to present something that they then could misrepresent and tear apart. And all we are interested in is finding out what the truth is. So, so that's where we're at right, in studying this. But we believe that if we can put this document together um, and that it can have sufficient explanation, that it, it will help those who are searching for light uh, to recognize where we are at in Earth's history. So, um, we, we had uh, lots of symbols, and I'm going to, you know, when I'm, I haven't had a chance this weekend, things didn't go too well. Um, but in trying to get this, I'm going to have lots of footnotes and charts and diagrams and mathematics all worked into this document. So that when we're looking at each of these sections, we're going to have everything there that we need um, to interpret why we're, or to understand why we're making this interpretation. So we're going to jump back to verse 10. And um, in verse 10, we, we had some struggles because when we look at Seleucus, Seleucus, of course, is the king of the north. And we're just saying, well, the king of the north is the USA. And then he has these sons. So it's going to be Seleucus' sons. And then we're saying, well, there's Seleucus the third, and there's Antiochus the third. Now, Antiochus the third, well, who is he? Is, um, you know, this is, is this an American president? Is this just the U.S. in general? Is it an American government? Right. That's where we're having trouble here because we did with the king of the south take Ptolemy the third as being by. Right. So there. So maybe in some way we would have to say, well, how do we fit Trump in here? And, and we can see that Trump is there, right? We can see that Trump has, has come against the globalists, just as we saw with in Persia, right? But this globalist now, even though we see Greece as being the globalists, Greece has these, this, these characteristics, um, that we that that make it that that has the king of the south, so that becomes a problem. We said, well, Greece is globalism, but now we have Greece divided in in the king of the south with the atheistic communism, however we want to describe it, wokeism, paganism, all these types of things, and then we have within the globalist symbol of Greece we have the king of the north, right? And, and how do we justify that? So, and I said it in, in a way that's not really a question, but let's say it is a question. How do we justify that we can take um, the fall of the Soviet Union, which is Alexander's kingdom, and we can have an aspect of it that we call the United States. How did we do that? Does anybody remember how we did that? this would be an important thing to know. How do we do that? How do we get the United States, which is the king of the north, as a result of the fall of the Soviet Union? Anybody? 
And it was part of the thing that was the controversy that we had dealing with uh, one of his princes. So if, if the aspect of atheist, atheistic communism moves from the Soviet Union to the UN, is the United States part of the UN? As far as I know, the U U.S. has been part of the U.N. since its inception. Right. But that means that the U.N., which has been this globalist um, entity, right? It's the United Nations, right? It's, it's globalism, right? Um, with the fall of the Soviet Union, we see that the United States, which which actually was involved in the fall of the Soviet Union, So in a sense, you have to sort of separate those. But, but the United States is the king of the north, connected with the papacy. And it leads to the fall of the Soviet Union. But the aspect that made the Soviet Union the king of the south moves to the UN. But we know that one of the, one of the generals, one of the princes, he's going to align himself with Ptolemy, right? He's a prince who doesn't get a territory, right? And that's going to be who? Who's going to be the first one? It's going to be Seleucus the first, right? So Seleucus, and, and we had this, this problem because I was saying, well, you know, one of it could be one of Alexander's princes. But I think the primary application here is that it's one of the UN's princes, one of the countries that is part of the UN. He takes on a characteristic that is the king of the north. That is, we can't just look at the Soviet Union falling. We have to look at what the Soviet Union represented. So the United States isn't part of the Soviet Union, but it is part of the UN. And so when globalism, this atheistic communism, is now no longer a part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union becomes a Christian country again um, and seeks to be so somewhat capitalist, though it is corrupt capital capitalism, type of crony capitalism. Um, it's definitely not a command economy like it was under the USSR. Um, we now have one of the princes, one of the nations of the, Uni of the United Nations, now becoming the king of the north because this this kingdom this globalist kingdom is divided so the king of the south aspect still stays with the un but the king of the north is the united states now does that make sense to people because that is the whole premise and what this is based upon with, without that understanding, there's no way that we could move forward in this battle about the king of the north and the king of the south. And we know that if we, we look at how Chalitu would have looked at it, and from, from what I've watched of his videos, is that he's going to put this way back with, with what happens in 1798 to 1989, right? But we see that we need to bring this to our history. So then we can, um, and we can see that that Soviet-Afghan war, which precedes the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, makes sense in the context of the United States being one of the, U the countries of the UN, one of the princes, actually becoming the global economic power, right? Um, basically, the United States has won that Cold War, and all during this time it has been seeking to be in control of this global economy, which it is, right? So it gains the territory of Syria, Iran, right? The global economy controls all the trade routes. It is policing the world, and the United States is prospering because of it. 
So then we come to the end of years. And so in the end of years, that's verse six, after the first and second Syrian wars, that is 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel. Right, so we're gonna look at it first as that. Then Ptolemy the second Philadelphus and Antiochus the first Soter join themselves together. There's this treaty and that's in 252 BC. But we parallel that to what happened at 9-11, right? And, and what happens is this type of seduction, let's say, for the king's daughter, that's Berenice, daughter of Ptolemy the second, representing this wokeism uh, comes in. It's, it's, it's the king's daughter of the South, right? Of the UN, of the globalists. She'll come to the king of the North to make an agreement, a peace through a marriage alliance, right? And we're saying that that's connected to the Patriot Act, spiritualism, but she, Berenice, wokeism, she'll not retain the power of the arm, lose her position from the former queen, Laodice, decision of the people is what, DC means, it means a people judged, it can mean as well, or people judging. So in this democratic process, um, we have the election of Trump. Trump, just as he did in uh, as Xerxes in the Persian kingdom, he has this war against globalism, right? He stirs up all against the realm of Grecia. Here in this case, we're dealing with two different illustrations. This is within the kingdom of Greece. Um, so she she loses her position from the former uh, Queen Laodice, that is, for this democratic process where Trump is elected. And neither shall he, that is Antiochus II, the USA, stand. Right. So we're saying that this is going to be uh, dealing with January 6th, 2021, because um, Antiochus II is assassinated by Laodicea, Laodice, and that would parallel with the election of Biden. So the America under Biden, the American military becomes impotent. Um, but wokeism shall be given up. So executed by Laodice. This is a backlash against wokeism, is what we're saying. And they that brought her, um, the casualties of the proponents of wokeism, and the one whom she begat, her son Biden. Right? So so Biden is not going to stand. And he and Tychus II, um, it is the USA, falls, right, as being the one that strengthened her in these times. So um, and we have the word times, which is eight, six, two, five, six, seventeen years and forty six days, November ninth to December fifth as a symbol. Okay, so so we could take all of this and we could put this on this line. And then we addressing something that that happens in a sense, it's 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 going back to to what has happened. So, so out of the branch of her Berenice's wokeism, that is the uh, roots, out of Berenice's roots, wokeism's roots, um, we have Biden, right? He stands up in his estate, right? So this is, again, dealing with his election. Um, so there's this propaganda campaign. And we know the propaganda campaign happens before the election, uh, but it still continues. And with Biden as president, he, he enters into the fortress, the U.S. Con Constitution of the King of the North, that is uh, Seleucid Syria, the U.S., and she'll deal against them, attempt to exact revenge for his sister's death. And so this is the lawfare against Trump, and she'll prevail, win the third Syrian war, the 2020 election. So it's going backwards and just repeating that. And she'll also carry captives into Egypt, gods, their gods, um, so this would be pantheism, transgenderism, and with their princes take captives to Egypt. That's the celebrities captivated, right? So what's happening in the, in the media, there's much more than just celebrities, right? So we have the spoils of war, the Hollywood, the multinationals, the tech industries. And we're saying that he, Ptolemy III Biden, shall continue more years 
and the king of the north. So we're saying that the king of the north, Seleucus II here, in some ways uh, represents uh, the USA, but in some ways also Trump, right? Trump being an example of make America great again. So the king of the south, Ptolemy III Biden, shall come into his the government, the U.S. government, and so into Seleucus's kingdom, and he shall return into his own land, uh, the UN, uh, World Health Organization, um, in that period of time. So then it says his, Seleucus, sons. Now, so if we say Seleucus is the USA, if we say Seleucus here is Trump, I mean, his sons shall be stirred up. You know, I mean, if we're going to take that literally, we apply it to uh, his two sons that, um, I mean, obviously you have, a camera, there's what, Eric and um, uh, Donald Trump Jr., right? But I don't know if I would do that. All that we know is that these these could represent the Republican Party. They could represent lots of different things. But they're stirred up um, or desire to war against Egypt. And so the propaganda campaigns we see happening um, to try to get Trump elected again. So question. Yeah. Instead of applying this literally as Trump's sons. Yeah. Why couldn't it be a, a rise, but a weaker rise of Protestantism and Republicanism? Okay, so... That is very good. Um, apostate rep republicanism and Protestantism. How's that? Well, or you just want republicanism and Protestantism. That's you know that's what I'm looking at right now because basically the the main themes that Trump was supporting and promoting was that this is a sovereign nation. We know that the nation is going to lead out in the Sunday law, but it's mm -hmm. going to take both of these horns for this to occur. Right. And we already have the daughter of the King of the South being, you know, all of this atheistic communism, wokeism, pan pantheism, transgenderism, all that stuff, right? Right. And so it makes sense that the sons of Seleucus, the sons of the U.S., and there's two of them, right, uh, would represent republicanism and Protestantism in their apostate forms. So, and, and that's a church-state uh, relation. Now, Okay, so so Protestantism as a political Protestantism, right? Okay. okay. So not just a religious Protestantism. It's more political than religious. That's why it's a son. Okay. Uh, they shall be stirred up, desire to war against Egypt, right? So uh, propaganda campaign against wokeism. And, and one of the things we could say about that, and uh, I've been capitalizing wokeism, um, when we look at, you know, at the alternate media like YouTube and so forth and X and um, Rumble and things like that, I mean, you definitely have a propaganda campaign going on. And, and we might sympathize with it. Uh, in some ways, right? Because obviously we see, you know, wokeism as atheism, communism, paganism, all these bad things. But what they're offering in its place isn't really any different. I mean, it's different, but it's not any better. Right? It's not the gospel. It is political. And you're not going to be able to conquer evil with politics. That's Satan's ground. 
right? So, you know, to say it's a propaganda campaign, it is, right? The truth is, is always a, a casualty of any kind of war. And so you may sympathize with a lot of the things being said, but the reality is it's not the whole truth. Okay. So when they assemble a multitude of great forces, raise a large army, you know, um, you know, I put here force of probably should be for civil war um, in this case, uh, civil war. But to raise a large army, uh, this is media, right? This is the different forms of media that are being employed in this propaganda campaign. Now it says one son. So if we're saying Republicanism and Protestantism are the sons, I mean, it could be a Republican president, right? So that that's a possibility. Right. Right. So is it a Republican, Republican president, you know, or is this something else? Is it just... Um, yeah, something to do with you know, the Republican Party. So just, but maybe what we, and, and the question is, is it the religious right? Is it, um, but we're going to say, well, it's going to be the second one, you know, Antiochus the third. Um, so I would think it would refer not to the religion, but to the the Republican side of things, right? So we have a Republican president, possibly. I still have a question mark there because um, I'm not certain about it. But shall come and overflow and pass through. Now, we know that this is the language of the Sunday law. So I, I'm going to put here Sunday law, but I'm not talking about the national Sunday law. But something that's that's a type of it or a precursor to it. So, so again, I'm going to leave the question mark there. So, if we're going to say that Antiochus the Third is just one of the sons of Seleucus, um, I'll just put republicanism there. Return and fight against Egypt. Now that's the UN. Right, and shall be stirred up even to his. Now, this is Ptolemy the Fourth's fortress. Now, Ptolemy the Fourth. Now, we have Ptolemy the Third as being Biden, right? So, I don't think we want to. Now, we put Biden there, and I'm still, you know, hesitant about that. Except that it does point to the election of Biden. So, however, we want to look at. That. We could say, you know, globalist dem Democrats or something. But Biden represents. But I'm not going to say, well, Antiochus, uh, you know, the third is Trump and I'm not, or one of Trump's sons or next president or anything, just Republicanism. So Ptolemy the fourth isn't going to be the next president. He's not going to be a person. You just say, well, Ptolemy the fourth, Philippat, this is the kings of the south. That's the UN's fortress. So there is going to be an attack against wokeism. Now, so they stir up this army, but what this is saying, if we're continuing on, when we get to Raphia, Raphia is a victory for the South. So even though there's going to be this war, based on what we're seeing here, we're making a prediction. What we would say is this battle of Raphia is a battle. Now, um, like even when we put Sunday law there, um, and I put the question marks in verse 10, I think that there's going to be something religious behind what's happening. It's not going to be the Sunday law, but we're going to see a, a move um, for the religious right in the United States in a very watered down apostate Protestant way. Not like the religious right in the 90s, 
is really more religious. This religious right is, is not even really a church movement. And they're not necessarily concerned about uh, the Sunday, but basically they want to control um, others, right? That they're going to be taking the same type of things that were done to them under the pandemic and all of that. And they're going to use the law to enforce their ideas. And, and we can we can see that already even in, in, in stuff that we agree with. I mean, we uh, uh, was it Rowan Wade? Is that, uh, you know, we can see this backlash, that this battle going on over, over rights, you know, women's rights, transgender rights, whatever kind of rights that exist that are group rights against individual rights. But we, we know that the religious right, that, that republicanism is going to do the same thing, that, that individual rights will be trampled on. Correct? But there isn't going to be a balance. We go from one ditch to the other. Agreed. Okay. So when we get to verse 11, the Battle of Raphael, we now have this battle that's going to occur. And what we're saying, based on this, if this is true, what the conclusion would be is that we're going to have this battle being lost to the religious right in this sense. So they're going to they're going to be waging this war. In some ways they've already have been winning it. We might even put that some of this, you know, happened in in the midterm elections. You know, the Republican Party uh, gained control of um, uh, Congress, right? So they gained control of the House. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Even though they, even though um, you know, Biden's still in charge of the executive branch. Um, the Republican Party's in control of the House to some degree, right? I mean, it's pretty minuscule control, but they're in charge. Um, and so things have been happening. So we can say that that's, there's this backlash, but they're going to lose, right? So if we were going to make a prediction, I'm not saying we are, but you know, if we're going to make a prediction, we'd say, if this is now them stirring up their forces to come against wokeism, uh, they're going to lose. Then maybe that means losing the election. I don't know. Maybe it means winning the election initially. Maybe that's that's that first response of because we can take chapter eleven verse ten as being the king of the north defeating the king of the south. But then we're going to have the king of the south defeat the king of the north. And then we're going to have the king of the north defeat the king of the south, right? And so what we're looking for in 11 to 13 is Raphia, and then and then we're going to see Paneum, right? And, and that's going to be ultimately this defeat of the king of the north, the United States, in this, with uh, this church and state Sunday law. So we really look for the Sunday law itself in the Battle of Paneum, right? That, that's going to be the midnight cry. Now, that's going to be the image of the beast. And we say, well, it's the Sunday law. The Sunday law follows shortly after. So obviously, there's first a big victory, and then it comes to the point of the Sunday law. So we know that the Sunday law is the result of, of national ruin, right? That, that the United States is in a desperate situation to retain its economy its status, and that the Sunday law is an attempt to do so, but it's going to ultimately lead to its demise, right? Is that how we understand what happens in end-time events? That we've understood this for... I would agree. Okay. So all of this precursor to that doesn't change what we've always believed as Seventh-day Adventists. It just shows us some of those details of what has happened. How we can take this history, the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Paneum, 
and place it on our line. What well, Jeff, you know, developed from 2016, first getting that line, 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, then in early 2017, saying that, you know, we have this pandemic between Rafi and Paneum, and we can see that, that that does apply in type, right? So what happened with the pandemic was a type of what's going to happen, but it wasn't the actual event. So we know that Midnight and Midnight Cry are still future, and and that all of this that has happened in our history is typified on that. So there becomes a problem when we now start to say, well, this is the future, right? It's easy to look at the past and say, here's the parallel. But if we're, we're going to make a prediction about the future, um, it's definitely going to be a less detailed uh, portrait of what's going to happen. We know that there is this battle. And this has been, for me personally, the big struggle ever since I became a Seventh-day Adventist is how is the world, which is becoming more and more secular, going to support a religious Sunday law? Because it's not just a, you know, um, a, a new age Sunday law. It's not a, um, you know, a woke Sunday law. It's not about climate change. It is about religion, right? For it to be meaningful at all, it has to be a religious Sunday law. And it needs to be embraced by the world. And the world is caught up in this battle right now. So we have to see a major paradigm shift in the views of people in the world regarding religion, right? Agreed. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we see in the Battle of Rafi and the Battle of Paneum is that major shift. And how that exactly is going to unfold, I don't think that we can know. I don't think I can I can say, yes, you know, this is this is a battle between nations. This isn't a battle between nations. This is a battle of ideologies. And wokeism and communism and whatever all those other, you know, atheistic isms that are connect connected with atheism, they have to predominate, but they have to do so much damage. And this is where, you know, if you take the World Economic Forum into the picture, I mean, they're extremely juvenile. Um, uh, it's a juvenile organization. It's something that, you know, if you're going to believe in, in the World Economic Forum, you know, you're in junior high, right? That's going to make sense to you then. But it's not a mature ideology. It's an extremely naive uh, um, and impotent e ideology, right? They're, they're not going to be able to uh, implement their, their plan. But the one thing the World Economic Forum can do, and all of these young people who are, are buying into this neo-Marxism or whatever you want to call it, is it because it doesn't even make sense. I mean, it's, it's not really Marxism. What they can do is destroy uh, society, right? Society can fall apart. And, and we should be able to see that. I'm just fixing some of Does that make sense to people, what I'm talking about? I think you're laying a good groundwork right now. Okay. So, so we're going to see the world move in, in a way that's going to be so destructive that when we talk about the pandemic, this is going to be worse. 
Can we see that? that we can see famine. And, yes, we can. And, and disease that results from famine, that we can see riots, that we can see civil war, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. That the rich and the poor, the people that have and the have nots, fighting against each other. And that the only solution that's going to be put forward is that we need to go back to God. Right? That has to happen. That's the only scenario that I see that is possible. Back in the 90s, when, when we were studying about Sunday law and Adventists were predicting Sunday law, it was always kind of like, well, you're going to have this moral majority win an election in the United States, and they're just going to enforce this Sunday law on everything. You know, so let's say they get a 55% majority, and then they bring in a Sunday law. Is that really what the Sunday law is about? Isn't it a massive movement supported by nearly everyone? Let's look at this. Yeah. Okay. You're using your premise. Mm -hmm. But let's combine this with what we were seeing for July 18th. Okay. We wind up with a nation attacking. We, okay. We wind up seeing the United States again be attacked just like it was on 9-11. Yeah, that's what we expected. Yeah. Now, the attack is again fully unprovoked. We have either in power a very weak person or we have a very strong person. We don't know which at this point. Mm -hmm. But when the attack occurs, because of the severity of the attack, liberals and conservatives come together fueled by apostate Protestants that are saying that this happened because we have given no um, that we have accepted none of God's warnings. Mm -hmm. We've given no heed to his to his warnings. So and, and we know that Islam is a part of this. Right, because Islam I see as a catalyst in, in some of this. Okay. Right. So because we talk about the king of the north and the king of the south, these two ideologies. Um, but we also know that Islam is there. Now it's not really listed here in this story. Right? Right. But I know. Um, but we do know that 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 attacks that are going to happen on the United States, one of the reasons that um one of the, I guess, the enemies that comes in, you know, you're going to have famine, you're going to have wars, you're going to have all of these things. Uh, but Islam becomes a part of that because it's a part of the fall of, you know, what what happened to to the Eastern Roman Empire, right? Right. So, so it definitely has a part to play in this as well. So. But it's not a battle between Russia and the United States. Which is what Ptolemy, or not Ptolemy, what Chalatu suggested. Um, I'm just looking at the word Ptolemy. Um, you know, because he said, you know, Russia and the United States. And we see that expanded upon with Parminder and Tess, right? So that, and of course, from their perspective, you know, um, You know, they're on the side of wokeism, but none of it really makes any sense. But you can see here that we have we have wokeism has to win a battle, right? It's got to come and and wreck things so badly 
Right. And, and that's what happens, right? Remember, his heart shall be lifted up and he shall cast down many ten thousands. But but the king of the south, Ptolemy IV, but we're just going to say that's the king of the south, that's wokeism, shall not be strengthened by it, not complete the conquest of Syria, right? For the king of the north shall return. So, you know, in this case here, we're, we're not really dealing with the United States and, you know, we're dealing with more ideologies in this battle of Rafi and Pania in our application of them. And so I don't know that we can, we can say, here is what's going to happen in the Battle of Raphi and Paneum in the details that we have in the earlier verses. So, you know, if we're going to deal with what the king of the south is, Ptolemy IV, what he represents, well, you know, this is the globalist. This is atheistic communism. It's the king of the south, right? It's this atheistic power. But it's not a country. Right? We're not looking at the king of the north and the king of the south as countries fighting against each other. So, so wokeism is going to do some, some damage right? in this fourth Syrian war. They're going to continue this fourth Syrian war and you're going to end up um, you know, with the fifth Syrian war. So the fourth Syrian war represents you know, the war connected with the Battle of Raphia, the fifth Syrian war uh, with the, the Battle of Paneum. Okay. So, so the religious right, whatever we want to call it, apostate Protestantism, apostate Republicanism, it's ultimately going to defeat, you know, all of this craziness. But in defeating it, it's because the craziness has done so much damage that we get the extreme, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> So then, you know, we, you know, when we start to look at verse 14, you know, you see uh, Rome come in. But then you're going to have these histories repeating, right? So it's it still becomes difficult. I mean, the question was, could we just take this and lay it over top of our history? Could we take Daniel 11 to 13 and just say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is our history. This, we, we can just... Take Raffi as being, you know, November 9th, uh, 2019, and Paneum as, as July 18, 2020, or, you know, even try to apply it in some other way. And we definitely can do that because all these histories are parallel. But I still think we have to look at Raffi and Paneum here. If we're going to put it on our line, that these are things that are in the future, Right. So this is going to be midnight and the midnight cry on that line that Jeff had in 2016. And that we're not to midnight yet. And so things are going to get worse before they get worse. Right. Right. OK. And and I know that many. Many Christians, many Adventists would like to see, they see republicanism as something that's going to win against the craziness in this world. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, that's why we're not political. Because no matter which direction you look, it's all Satan's kingdom. It's not Christ's kingdom. As we studied in the Friday night studies dealing with uh, us being ambassadors, right? We're not, we're not of this country. We're not of this world. We're ambassadors from heaven um, meant to give the gospel to the world. And even though we may sympathize with some of the ideas, the ideals, let's put it that way, of what republicanism is, 
and what Christianity should be. That's not what's going to be the result as the fight against the fight of these ideologies is is worked out. So, so in the fifth Syrian war, which you know we're going to say, well, that's connected to the battle of of Padeum, right? So if we go to verse 14, in those times after the fifth Syrian war, there shall many stand up, make war against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people. So this is the papacy, this is Rome, right? And so we have to put it to the papacy here. So when we have this war against wokeism, the papacy steps in and it is, exalts itself to establish the vision. This is the persecution of God's people. Right? But that, and that's going to be the threefold alliance. That's what, that Sunday law is not just the Sunday law in the United States, it's the universal Sunday. And it's, and it's going to expand until, you know, after the close of probation, it, it works into a death. So, but then when we have, so the king of the north, the Seleucid, Syria, Antioch, Antioch Antiochus IV shall invade uh, Egypt in 169, 168 BC and cast up a mound, take the most fenced cities, Memphis, Alexandria, and others, and the arms of the south, the Egyptian army shall not withstand, fall prey to Assyrian invasion. Neither his chosen people, the Jewish people, uh, could resist the Syrian occupation of Judea. Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Right, so Seleucid Syria would dominate Judea and Egypt under Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Right, so that brings us to that history. So then, when we deal with sixteen and 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 four and to twenty two, we're going to have a repeat of history. We now have Rome, right? So Rome is going. We're going to look at the history of Rome after we complete Greece. Uh, to see that that's going to repeat our history as well. Pagan Rome. It's a repeat of history. history. We understand that already. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really prepared to like put in the red in here. I think what we need here is more just what we discussed is an explanation that this battle of Raphi and Paneum, that we don't understand the details, But we can say that the king of the south is representing a specific ideology of globalism, of communism, and that the king of the north is representing republicanism and Protestantism. And they're going to have this battle of ideologies. But the details of those battles, we can't say, you know, Who's going to be president or anything? I don't think that that you know when we stop with uh, the presidents of the United States, the way that we've laid them out in um, Revelation 17, in applying them to these kings, we we have to say that there is an end of the United States that is occurring in some way. That we just have these seven kings, but the eighth is going to be. The beast that was and is not, and yet is, right? That's the papacy. But it doesn't mean that we can number how many presidents there are going to be. Right? So, you know, I think people are making a mistake to try to say, well, it just says, you know, however we count those presidents, there's there's seven of them, and then there's the eighth could be a president or the eighth could be the papacy, or whatever people are doing. I think they're restricting God's word in a way that God's word is not meant to be restricted. So, so any thoughts on what we're talking about? I know Dwight's had some thoughts. Anyone else? Angela's had some comments in the chat. Uh, maybe Ivanka Trump could be the Republican apostate Protestant. 
I don't know. Um, and some stuff about Fred Veltman's Life of Christ Research Project. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Published in 1988, uh, Veltman's paper. Yeah, I don't know who that is, so I can't really say much about it. Um, Okay, so let's let's take a look at some things about these verses as far as the symbols. So one of the things we did with Daniel 11, 11, that we could compare it to our history, is we took the verse and I added up the Hebrew numbers. So let's, let's go back here. We're going to back up a bit. So I went to 11, 11, and I... Took all these numbers, I put them in a in a file, uh, uh, um, uh, Excel file, right? And then you know I could I could get rid of the text, so I just had the numbers themselves, and then I I put a total there. And when I did that, it totaled them up, but it didn't include the last number three twenty three zero two seven, which is a symbol, the word hand. Uh, Yad is a symbol of um, two seven three or March twenty seventh, right? So it it's something that's in our lines, and so it didn't add that. And when it added it up, it gave us a number of six seven three four zero, which is one hundred and eighty seven prophetic years plus twenty days. The six seven three two zero is exactly. Uh, uh, 360 times 187, right? So, so it 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 didn't add it up, and so this mistake that I made, when I make mistakes in in these types of things, it's always providential. Now, do we have a present precedent for taking a span of time and taking a portion of it off? to analyze that time. It may seem a little bit arbitrary, but how many days did the manna fall? We know it, it fell for 40 years, less a month, and that's going to be 494 lunar months, which also helps us to place it where we've placed it, in, you know, starting in 1533 BC, 1493 BC. It's going to be 2,084 weeks, the whole the whole total. But if we count the number of days that the manna fell, the actual from when it first fell to the last day it fell, it's 14,400 plus 187. So we have a symbol there. It's one tenth of 144,000, and one tenth represents um, a remnant, right? Okay, so. So something that relates to our history. Um, and you have the symbol of, of uh, 187, right? July 18th. Now here we have July 18th and 20 days, right? So we have a symbol, July 18th, 2020. And then we have the March 27th date. Now, if we're saying that Daniel chapter 11, verse 11, this, this pivotal verse, Raphia, is something that's still in the future, midnight. Why is it attached to the symbol of July 18th and March 27th? So that's just a simple question. Does that mean we can take this and say it has to do with that period of time in our lines? That we could we can connect it to our 777 structure? And that we don't put it into the future as midnight is in the future. We say it's already happened. Or is there something else that it's telling us?
Okay, so Angela says, you know, we can cut the 2300 off from the 2520. Well, what we could do is we can take the 2520 and take uh, 220 off of it, right? To get 2300. 220, a symbol of restoration, dealing with the, peak, the period from uh, 677, when the seven times for literal Judah begins, uh, to its restoration in 457, right? We have other precedents for this, other things as well. So, so we can see that. But the question here is, how can we, how come these symbols are there in Daniel 11, 11? Like, how do we interpret these symbols? Do we say, well, that just means it's about our history and not about the future? Or do we, um, do we do something else? Can we just say that God's speaking to us now who are in this movement who understand these symbols that we can see that all of this is something that we can then interpret in this way, that it, it affirms our interpretation of the present truth application. Amen. Okay. So, so we saw with Daniel 11, 6, um, that we could uh, look at, at things here, like, you know, 11.6 can be 9.11. You can see this end of years. Um, you know, we could see all the symbols here of, of 9.11. And then when we get to 11.9, um, we, we took um, this verse and we added it up. The numbers was 2, 3, 1, 1, 1. So it added up to 23,111. Of course, 111 it itself is a symbol of, of our line dealing with January 11th, uh, the Levitical chiasm that marks the end there. But also that number is simply 11 times 11 times 191. Right. So... Um, so the number was 23111 divided by 100, right? Um, so, so 11 times 11 times 991, 9, 191. And 191 represents both November 9th and September 11th. And of course, 11 times 11 represents Daniel 11. So we can see that we can apply raffia to our history, but it's only in type. Right to to how we have applied it. It's it's pointing forward. It's a type of what's going to happen. Everything that's happened in our lines at, at this point has has been typical of what's going to happen on a bigger line. That we're really in a zoomed in line. We're not on that bigger line. And when people try to say we're on the bigger line, that the Sunday law is imminent. You know that Trump's going to be the next president, and he's going to bring in the Sunday law. They're making a grave error. They're going to be disappointed. Because it's not going to happen the way that they expect. So, so we can see that we have this, you know, 11, 11 verse 6, 11 verse 9, and 11 verse 11, all having these this numeric significance, tying us to the symbols of um, 9-11, 11-9, March 27th, and July 18th. All of those things dealing with the 777 structure. <clears throat> any, any other thoughts on that, on those points? Now, I just want to make another comment. So um, 
dealing with this 23111. Now, Iran has helped me with the tool. And this tool is when we add up a verse, right? We can add up uh, all the Hebrew numbers in a verse. And so um, so he he extracted those Hebrew numbers from each verse and and put it into a document that's a little bit hard uh, to read. Um, but at this point, you know, that's what we have. And we have this verse, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 6, that adds up to 23,111. Now, um, in this document, that number shows up seven times, right? So that means that there is um, there are some verses that add up to that. Now, the chances that you can get a verse adding up to any particular number in the Bible is very low. You know, it's just not usually going to happen. Now, um, the verses that add up to 23111 is um, the first one is in Genesis. And uh, it's in Genesis chapter 25, verse 1. So let's just take a look at this here. So Genesis 25, verse 1. So this verse here, then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. This verse, if you add up these uh, Hebrew uh, definitions, the, the Hebrew numbers, you're going to get 23111. Okay. Now, what else is there about this verse, Iran, in uh, in the Bible index? What is there about this verse that we should also take note of? If you uh, the reverse reverse sum is seven seven seven. Okay, is that the case? Did you look it up? Yeah, I looked it up. Okay. So, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so, so uh, the reverse sum is 777. It's also uh, the Bible verse is a 660, right? And the book verse is 660. So we have this number 660 as well. Now, 660, of course, is... Uh, the fact is this is the reverse book number because it's the first book. So it's the 66th uh, uh, book in the Bible backwards, right? So you get the book, you have the verse, and then you have the 777 reverse sum. And um, and then the what they call the Lex sum here. I'm just going to show you this here. So this is what we're looking at. Right, so you can see all these different things. So the reverse verse is 34. The Bible verse is six, 660. Uh, from the, the end of the Bible, the reverse verse is 34.3. Right? It has all these things. The book verse, because it's first book of the Bible, is also 660, just like the Bible verses. And then... Um, this lex sum, that's the, the, the lexicon sum number, is 23111. So it's the same as Daniel chapter 11, verse 6. Okay? And then you can see the uh, the reverse sum is, seven. that has to do with gematria, right, of the verse, is 777. Okay? Uh, the regular sum is 438. Okay? Does that make sense to people? Uh, how this is working. So so this verse also has that characteristic. Now, the next verse that has this characteristic um, is in, now it's always hard to find out where these are. I have to go back and look. So you're going to, I'm going to, uh, it's, um, it's Job. So Job chapter 29 um, verse 68, I think. 
I think that's Job 2968. No, that can't be. So I'm not sure where this is. It's 68 something. So let me find out what this is. Um, oh, Psalm 78, 68. Right. So that verse also adds up to uh, 23111. So Psalm 78, uh, verse 68, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. So if I go here, so let's see what this yields. Um, so Psalms 78, 68. Okay, chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph, chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. So we can see there, there's the Lexum 23111. Um, nothing else about the other numbers that I noticed in particular. Um, right. But but you can see this now, this verse itself. Um, what's the context or the meaning of this verse? This is God choosing, right? If you go back and look at this verse, there's lots of stuff in it. Um, but God choosing Judah over Joseph or Ephraim, right? Kingdom of the South. So it's about the king of the South and the king of the North. I guess you could look at it in that sense. It's about the North and the South, but God's North and South. So we have that verse. Uh, the next one is okay. So this one I missed. Unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. So this is. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see this. Can I make it bigger? Oh, it's way too big. So there was this verse uh, here. I know this is a bit tedious, but I think this is important. Job 29, 21, right? So if you go there, that's the one. Job 29, 21. Unto me, unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. And so you can see that verse there. Um, the book verse is 684, the Bible verse is 13554. I'm not going to analyze those numbers right now. Um, but if we go to Job, Job, what is it? Job 20, You can see it's the 49th uh, uh, book, verse chapter 14, Bible chapter 675. So nothing that I see particular there other than this characteristic of 2311. But the fact that we have 
any two verses the same. There's not many verses that have the same number. I'll show you here. This one might be a little bit hard to see. I'm going to have to make this easier to see. Um, okay, so what I have here is a, a document that I created. And this column here, column A, is all um, numerically in order, all of the different verses, the numbers they add up to. So the lowest number any verse adds up to is 1,393, right? So the Hebrew numbers. Um, but you can see there's very few that are going to have the same number. Um, and when they do, like the one that has the most is, I uh, can't remember what it is, 1,600 and something. Uh, yeah, 10,608. 10, and that's because all those verses all say, and the Lord said unto Moses. <laughs> so, so they have these single verses. And that's why those happen. So you're going to have some happen. But you can see that there's very few uh, that are going, all of these are going to say that. The Lord said unto Moses. Um, so you're going to see that, you know, there's a couple where you'll see two maybe of the same number. And sometimes that's because they're the same verse, uh, just in a different place in the Bible or, or just the same phrase somewhere. But this uh, 23111, take it here. Well, you're going to see there's six of them here, right? Now, there's seven times it shows up in the list because there is the 2311th verse. Um, so out of the seven times it shows up in that uh, file, Six of those are going to be verses, and they're not identical verses. They're unique verses, so that's very, very odd. Okay, so, so when we continue looking through these verses, uh, go back here. Um, chose Judah. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. It also adds up to 23111, right? So that's in Ezekiel, uh, I believe, chapter 1. And um, then we also have, so the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return unto his land. Well, that's um, chapter 11, verse 9. I guess that was the one that added up to that. Okay, I thought it was six. Okay, verse nine. And then um, and then we have this one for the priest lips should keep knowledge. That's just the 23,100, uh, 23,111 23, verse, right? So that's why that number is attached to it. Uh, but another text is they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. Now, that's, of course, in the New Testament. That's the last one, the seventh one. Now, how many? Um, so so this is the feeding of the either the 5,000 or uh, the 5,000 right here. And they did eat of the loaves for about 5,000 men. But we have these 12 baskets, Right. So we have these these symbols here. So we could look at this in more detail. It's just our time is nearly up. So so when we go back to this verse, so I guess it was um, Daniel chapter eleven verse nine. So I thought it was verse six, but um, oh yeah, it's eleven nine. Then I said six. Okay. So 11.9. So this, this one here that is 11.9 adds up to this number. It, the last verse, the, the last word is a symbol of July 21st in reverse. Um, so it gives us a symbol of midnight as well. But it's 11.9, right? So that's November 9th. And it adds up to 23,111 and is... Uh, that number is 11 times 11 times 191. So, so we can see how these symbols are here. 
but they're, they only could be understood by us, right? There's no way that Chawatu could have looked at the Hebrew numbers back in 2017 and, and made any sense out of them. They wouldn't have meant anything to him if he had added up these Hebrew numbers and all the other Hebrew numbers that we have here that we've used. So we can see that they tie to our history. What we are not going to say is that um, Daniel chapter 11, verse 11, dealing with the Battle of Raphia, is actually in our history, in our line. This is a, a way mark that we're moving towards. And so these symbols are here. They're giving us evidence that what we're doing here is correcting our understanding and application. But we can't make more of it than, than we should. We, we, can't, we can't start using these numbers to be our interpretation. Right? They're giving witness to, to our interpretation, but they are not our interpretation. How are we interpreting these? What's the basic thing that guides us in placing, in, in going through Daniel chapter 11 and placing these events on a line? Well, I guess I gave it away, right? What's the principle? To set events in order on a line from here to there. We're using Millerite history as our pattern. And as we, just as we did, with um, uh, uh, the Persian kingdom, where we set things on a line, we have to do the same thing with this. We have to be able to place these verses on a line just as we did here, right? We need to have a line like this. And we need to, to take these verses, and, and we still have to do some work on these because I, I need to have more information on why I'm, what events that I'm placing there from the particular verses. Um, just more explanation. But so this was the Persian, uh, this was, uh, pardon me, this isn't the Persian one, the Persian one's up, up here, somewhere. Um, It's just these, I guess it's this here. Yeah, this is the Persian one here, right? Dealing with Revelation 17 and how this relates to Persia. And so, so we got Greek, Greece on a line, but we need to continue drawing the line. So, um, so there's a lot of work still to do. Any questions or comments about what we're doing? I mean, it, it is a lot of information and we need to be able to put it in a framework that people can understand it. Are we on the right course? Is there any way that we could say, well, no, we, we're completely off base. Is there any indication that we're completely off base? There might be some things that we don't quite understand. There's quite a bit that we don't understand yet. Yeah. So this is just, this is one of those situations where we're going to have to examine it. We're going to have to examine it carefully and consider what we're, you know, really what we're, what we're looking at with this. Yeah. You know, yeah. So the one thing I don't like to do, like, I don't like making assumptions. I don't like guessing. I don't like um, um, I don't like trying to force things to fit. I don't like putting uh, square pegs in round holes. You know, things need to fit. But sometimes we have to spend a lot of time in understanding before we see how things fall into place. So an example for me was chronology. When I did chronology, I didn't just make things fit. I had to look at everything. And until everything fell into place naturally, um, I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't, I wasn't complete. I wasn't finished with what I was doing. 
once everything fell into place, there was little details that could be worked out here and there, but everything fit. And this is a lot of work, what we're doing on Daniel chapter 11. But I think it's necessary. I think, you know, we may end up taking as much time on Daniel chapter 11 as we did on the book of Judges. Right? It may take a whole year. It's possible. But we have to have it done, and it has to fit. It can't be something that's forced. You have to let the scriptures interpret themselves. And somebody watching might think, well, you know, you're trying to make things fit. But we're just trying to examine everything, right? And once we notice a detail, we have to say, well, we have this detail. How does it fit? We don't know. We don't know where this piece of the puzzle goes. But we have to identify that piece of the puzzle and recognize it for what it is. You know, it's certain characteristics. It fits somewhere in the big picture. We just, we just don't have the big picture. It's like doing a puzzle when you don't have the box. With a picture on it. It's a little bit difficult. But we do have things that guide us. So anyway, we're done for today. So let's close in prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study this morning and ask for your continued help. Help us to follow and serve you today. Help us to study your word and to pray and to seek you. Bring us together again to study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.